Somatic senses, as I mentioned, are any senses other than the special senses. They're the senses that we rely on perhaps the most to maintain homeostasis. And these senses are very versatile. We have a, a variety of different somatic senses that can tell us thing like, things like what is our blood osmolarity at any given moment. We don't obviously perceive all of this information. Perception occurs in the cerebral cortex. Information has to be processed in the cerebral cortex for us to become consciously aware. And you think about all of the things that we do to maintain homeostasis. You, um, you know that we maintain homeostasis to keep our blood pressure steady. We, we certainly maintain homeostasis to keep our heart rate um, steady at a, at a good clip necessary to supply our body with the nutrients and oxygen and, and so forth that we need. You are aware that we um, certainly maintain ho hormone levels to maintain homeostasis. We need to make sure we have enough thyroid hormone for our, to metabolize uh, for our metabolism. We need to have enough insulin for glucose. But uh, you're not aware of this, all these magical things that seem to be happening inside you. You couldn't tell me if I were to ask you what are your insulin levels right now you'd have no idea. You wouldn't have any idea what your glucose levels are right now either unless you were to go ahead and do a quick finger prick, prick and measure it using a glucose meter. Um, there's a lot that we don't have conscious awareness of and yet it still ticks on going. It, it still works beautifully and in part it involves um, sensory receptors that uh, we're not consciously aware of. We don't know what they're doing. We're not. We don't monitor it. In fact, only about one percent of information actually reaches of our from our somatic senses actually reaches the cerebral cortex, and therefore only one about one percent is uh, consciously perceived. Um, the rest is really automatic. It's going to be involving reflexes. It involves some of the regions in the brainstem, certainly the spinal cord, and these tend to occur automatically. Now, the somatic senses that we do perceive, that we understand and that we know about, uh, will reach the somatosensory cortex, which is this region, uh, which you can see there in blue, and this area here is going to process any information sent to it from the spinal cord, from the brainstem, from the facial um, senses. Let's flip back up here really. If you take a look at this, right, only I only highlighted four of them as being involved in the special senses. The rest of them are either motor, for example, this one ocular motor system, right? Uh, that's going to be about motor movement, um, you know, the trochlear nerve motor movement. But notice this one, the trigeminal, that's going to be sensations of the face. We have to be able to touch it. We have to feel where our muscles are moving. We have to, you know, be able to receive information, right? And of course, our facial muscle um, and so forth and so on. And so we do have sensory perception in our face that actually is part of the somatic motor nervous system. Going back here, um, from the somatic motor, somatomotor, or somatosensory cortex, information is often sent to other regions of the body where we apply meaning to that sensation and we can decide on an action. So for example, if you hear a, a loud sound in the middle of a night, you know, the somatosensory cortex will help integrate that sound and will alert perhaps the amygdala, which is responsible for fear and the amygdala will wake you up and you'll be, oh my gosh, what happened? And, and you'll go and check and see if there's a break in. Um, and so, you know, those types of things are important to integrate, not only just with the somatosensory cortex, but with the entire brain as a whole. Somatic senses can be, there's so many varieties of sensations that they detect, but we can break them down loosely speaking into mechanical, thermal, chemical, and what we call nociception or pain. These, uh, you know, generally each of these somatic sensories fit into one of these categories in one way or another. 
Pain is interesting. I want to highlight pain and talk about that one. Pain tends to be any of the above that can cause damage to the surrounding tissues. So pain can actually detect chemical stimuli if that chemical stimuli is burning or um, in other ways causing injury. It can detect thermal energy. So of course you get into a nice hot bath, it feels nice, but if you get in to put your hand in boiling water, that's gonna really hurt. And so, you know, thermal energy very quickly becomes painful if it's too hot or for that matter too cold and then same is true with mechanical energy we have all sorts of nice little touches and mechanical force you know just gentle stroking compression pressure vibration stretch but any of these things um well perhaps not the feather light touch but you know any of these things can quickly become painful once they become injurious so if if we have injurious force they can all become a pain signal that the somatic senses would detect. Taking a closer look at these categories, the mechanoreceptors are is a particularly broad class. We can further break down the mechanoreceptors into these three groups here. We've got proprioception, um, baroreception, and tactile reception. These mechanoreceptors respond, respond to mechanical stress, as, as mentioned, and these each okay, are going to have a very important role. Tactile receptors tend to be in the skin, and we're going to take a look at those. And proprioceptors tend to be in, in our skeletal and smooth muscles, so that we can actually determine how much tension or muscle tone is present in those muscles. And then baroreceptors are found in our arteries, and we'll talk about those. Those are actually very important. So the purpose of proprioception is actually to monitor our joints and our muscles, not just to prevent energy injury. I mean, you can imagine if you're, you're stretching, you know that if you stretch too far, you can actually injure yourself. And so you want to be careful about that and not overstretch. And so those proprioceptions will tell you, okay, this is this is starting to be too much. We can feel that. And you become aware that you need to adjust your position. But proprioception is so much more than that. Proprioception also allows us to have a feel for where we are in relationship to other objects. This is what keeps you from running into the table. And it often works in conjunction with our eyes. We can see the table, we can avoid the table, but if you turn off the lights, if you're in a familiar room, you still know where that table is. And while you might walk a little bit slower, simply because you know that you might misjudge something, or if you live in my house, you might step on a dog toy or a kid toy or the cat. And so you, you know, maybe you, uh, you shuffle your feet and move a little slower, but you still know where the table is and you still know where the chairs are and you still know where your bed is and you still know where the bathroom light switch is even without your eyes. And it's this proprioception, this awareness of where you are combined with the memory that you have, this spatial memory that is stored within the brain that allows you to be able to interact with your environment. These use muscle spindles that are found within the skeletal muscle and these muscle spindles will generate action potentials to these to neurons that inform both the spinal cord and the brain of, of stretch um, and compression and muscle tone. There are also proprioceptors in tendons which can alert you again in, regarding stretch and movement as well. Baroreceptors, as I mentioned, are found in blood vessels. They're also in the digestive system and the respiratory system and the urinary tracts. And their job is to detect the expansion of those blood vessels or the expansion of the respiratory uh, airways or the expansion of an uh, the arterioles in the uh, renal corpuscle, um, the expansion of, let's say, um, the large intestines. Um, they're responsible for detecting 
pressure that is generated when a blood vessel fills up. And so it it's actually a fairly common type of um, perception that occurs if we imagine for example that we have and I'm just going to do a quick rough sketch we have our heart and we're going to say that here's my aortic artery obviously this is not anatomically correct please don't shoot me as the heart pushes blood into the aortic artery that actually causes the blood of course to project forward but also to push against the walls of this artery and if we were to zoom in on the walls of this artery, we have, um, zooming in here, we are going to see, if I take a quick peek at this, what we would actually see is, of course, we're going to see the different layers of the arterial wall. So we'll have our simple squamous epithelial cells, okay? But we'll also are going to have our layers of smooth muscle and elastic connective tissue um, and smooth muscle tends to be both longitudinal and circular and I'm not going to draw all the layers but you can imagine with me and then embedded in there are our stretch our barrel receptors and what they do is they detect stretch because as the blood pushes against the walls of these blood vessels it's going to deform the blood vessel it's going to produce push it outward and so that will activate these little mechanoreceptors and the mechanoreceptors will begin to generate action potentials that will ultimately make it to the homeostatic centers of the brain and will cause changes necessary to maintain homeostasis. And so barrow means pressure and it just, the, the pressure pushing against the walls of those blood vessels, the walls of the digestive system, the walls of those renal tracts, all of those would um, represent or would be detected by barrel receptors. Tactile receptors are in the skin for the most part. Anywhere where we're going to feel sensation, so in um, detecting touch, pressure, etc., we can actually look at these. They're quite intricate and if we were to take a layer of skin and, and look at this we have tactile receptors that are buried deep tactile receptors that are more on the surface each of them responsible for detecting certain stimuli so if we look here really quickly here here's one of these um, free nerve endings and you can kind of see it there and I'm gonna make it really ugly okay but looking at that this is one of those sensory receptors that have these free nerve endings and these are delicate nerve endings they can be damaged but they're also very sensitive and so light touch would be detected by those free nerve endings so you imagine you know just stroking your fingers over the surface of the skin you're going to detect that there we also have these free nerve endings let me get a little bit of a smaller pencil here okay these free nerve endings right here that you can see that's too small you can see wrapped around the shaft of the hair. Okay, so those nerve endings as well are also going to detect, you know, those light strokes. So even if we just touch just the hair and not the skin, we would detect that as well with these free nerve endings. And so that would be your, your hair shaft root plexus, uh, like so. Now, if you take a look at this one here, this is, let me just highlight it in yellow right here so you can see where I'm looking at. And you zoom in and you look at that and we take a closer look at that um, you're going to see these little capsules you can see those right there you know here, well, here they are these little capsules right there and so what those are are nerve endings that are encapsulated okay um, they're protected and they are um, what they have is it's actually a multicellular complex and so you can actually see them if you zoom in right here where you can see these Merkel cells, that's what they're called. Okay, these Merkel cells shown right here, okay, that are synapsing with these neurons, and uh, together they are going to detect information, um, a little bit of a deeper information, so, so compression, for example that uh, they would be able to feel light compression like pressure just and so instead of a gentle stroke we're going to rest a finger on our skin and that's what would detect these, these Merkel cells and the nerve terminals shown there. If we 
continue to examine these, we have these capsules here, which let's go ahead and, and highlight and isolate those as well. Okay, and again, these are encapsulated neurons, and if we go ahead and we look at this, this would be called um, the tactile corpuscle, this outer region right here that encapsulates the dendrites there. And so these would be more for um, pressures that are going to squish those nerve endings, um, maybe for some stretch. If you imagine stretching your skin by pinching it, right, you can imagine that. So I'm going to pinch my skin, I'm going to deform my skin, and as you compress against those walls, they would actually cause um, ion channels to open up and activate those receptors. And then going deeper, we have these laminal corpuscles. These are deeper layer layers of uh, capsules, and again, you know, we have these dendrites encapsulated in them, and these are going to be more for deep pressure, so harder compression. And then we've got these interesting ones here, these bulbous, bulbous corpuscles, again, that are going to be used to detect even deeper pressure, more strong pressure, and um, perhaps pressure that would generate an injurious force. So we're going to get hard enough hit that it's going to cause a bruise, for example. So a, a deep um, compression or, or impact. We'll have a chance to look at these again in a little bit when I'm, I talk about uh, different function of these receptors, but I wanted to introduce those to you so you could see those. And of course you're going to have nerve endings and other types of um, squamous epithelium. Not all epithelium is keratinized. Of course we're going to have epithelial tissue lining um, any of our uh, body cavity openings, so certainly in the throat in the vagina, in the rectum, and so forth. And they would also, of course, have different levels of nerve endings, different types of nerve endings to detect stimuli there. Moving away from the mechanoreceptors, we have thermoreceptors. Now, we tend to think of cold and hot as if they're two separate things. As far as these thermoreceptors are concerned, these sensory receptors, they're not. Um, we detect, now some of these receptors will be more sensitive in different ranges of temperature. So we might have a receptor that is, is particularly sensitive to anything within the, uh, let's say, 40 to 35 degrees Celsius range. And so it would be activated by temperatures within that range. But we could also have a receptor that is sensitive to any kind of stimuli within the 20 to, let's say, I'm making these numbers up though, yeah. okay, 19 Celsius range, which would be a little chilly. And so these receptors structurally are very similar. They're, they're virtually the same, but their sensitivity is different, okay, based on small modifications of it. And I want you to understand this, that the difference between a, a receptor that is sensitive to warm temperatures and a receptor that is sensitive to cold temperatures is that cold, is simply less heat. So each of these detect heat, but they detect the quantity of heat. And so cold receptors would be activated in low heat conditions, and other receptors would be activated in higher heat conditions. We have, so they, they are still sensitized, but we have more receptors activated in low heat conditions than we do in high heat conditions. I'm not entirely sure is the reason for this, uh, but it is about three to four times more numerous that we've got these in the cold sensing conditions. It might perhaps be, actually, you know, honestly, I have no clue. Feel free to speculate. We can make up a reason. I don't know. But anyway, we do. That's, that's why. And if somebody knows, I'd be like, whoa, cool. So let me know. And then we have these chemoreceptors. These are sensitive to chemicals. Now understand these chemicals can be any number of things. It can be sodium ion, chloride ion, potassium ion, calcium ion, oxygen, carbon dioxide. Um, oh, amino acids, glucose. I can go on and on and on. These chemical substances would be found in the blood. Technically speaking, receptors that detect hormones would be considered chemoreceptors because hormones are, in fact, chemicals. 
Anything that detects cytokines released from the immune system would be a chemoreceptor. So just as one example, uh, we have receptors that specialize in detecting the osmolarity of the blood. They are, in fact, chemoreceptors, but we often refer to them as osmoreceptors to represent their subspecialty. And so you'll hear, us using, hear me using that terminology. Um, and then we have uh, nociception. And we'll actually revisit this when I talk about sensory neuron tracts or sensory tracts and how they run through the spinal cord. Nociception is the detection of pain. And these nociceptors, let me go back really quickly. Each of these chemoreceptors are specific to one particular type of chemical. So you have a chemoreceptor that detects sodium ions. End of story. You have a chemoreceptor that detects oxygen. End of story. You have a chemoreceptor that detects hydrogen ions. And so they're very specific, very selective to either one or at least a small family of chemicals that are all related to one another. Nociception, not so much. For nociception, it's really more about damaging the tissue. Or could we damage the tissue or did we damage the tissue? Okay. Quite often with nociception, what we actually have is um, a release of, so let's just imagine this, if you will. Let's say we have our uh, squamous epithelium, okay, and we've injured it. Maybe we, we've torn it, we've cut it, we, whatever you want to call it. And so we've, we've broken the skin, and we've got this little tear right there, and maybe we even have some capillary damage, so here's my capillary, and we've got some blood. My daughter is watching, she's into Zootopia right now, and, and she keeps quoting that scene, and I think everybody's going to think she's totally morbid, but the scene, the rabbit is doing this stage play, and she says, blood, 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 and death, and so my daughter quotes that, so I'm going to quote that to you, so we've got blood, 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 and death, hopefully not death. What happens here is these tissues that are damaged die, and so we've got these little dying cells, injured cells, and they send out chemicals into the blood, and those chemicals in turn attract um, our superheroes of our immune system, our white blood cells, and then the white blood cells actually send out chemicals, and ultimately we end up with release of chemicals called prostaglandins. This is one way we detect pain, prostaglandins. And you've seen these before. We talked about these when we were talking about hormones. These are eicosanoids. They're actually, they look like phospholipids, which um, those are what actually stimulates many of these nociceptors. Nociceptors respond to other stimuli as well, but this is actually why, depending on the type of energy injury, we can get a response to pain based on uh, just about any type of stimuli. If it causes tissue damage, we're going to feel that pain. Now, um, we have two types of nociception, and I told you about these a little bit, but I want to highlight them and emphasize them more. We have these alpha fibers, and I wrote A fibers, but really it's alpha fibers, and these are very fast, very rapid, sharp, extreme pain and they reach our somatosensory cortex very quickly and so we become consciously aware. So imagine you're running, you twist your ankle. The moment that that ankle distorts and contorts in unnatural ways, you're going to feel a very sharp, stabbing, immediate pain that says, ouch, I've been injured. And that actually will trigger a reflex. And that reflex is important. You will immediately, before you even become aware of the pain, you will immediately shift your weight off the injured ankle. And sometimes you shift it enough that there's not actually any kind of prolonged injury. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes the injury is bad enough to cause a sprain, or maybe in extreme cases even a break. Um, but that reflex still occurs, and that sharp, intense pain lets you know, ouch, things are hurt. And then let's say you do sprain your ankle. Well, it's going to throb. It's going to hurt. It's going to be painful. And that's actually the signal that's going to be carried by the type C fibers. And that will certainly reach conscious perception sometimes. But we only have a vague idea. And sometimes it's kind of on this fuzzy gray area where we kind of know we're in pain, but we're not quite aware of the pain. 
and it really just makes us not feel good and for biologically there is a benefit to this believe it or not you know if you broke your ankle you really shouldn't go out and like play tag with your friends and so this kind of helps you not feel good. So you're not going to make stupid decisions like go play tag with your friends. And so it kind of keeps you down so that you can recover and you can heal. It also um, tends to activate this interesting formation here called the reticular formation in the thalamus. This is also important for dreaming and keeping you asleep and paralyzing your muscles when you're sleeping. Um, and so... It's more of this vague idea, like, I'm achy, I'm hurting. Interestingly enough, you know, most people would say this is nasty. Ouch, no thank you, please spare me. But honestly, when this lasts too long, uh, this can cause some pretty serious public health consequences. It results in depression. And for reasons we don't quite understand, it often causes what we call comorbidities, where we have additional illnesses accumulating when and what they it starts as this chronic pain and so we have a number of chronic pain diseases that you as healthcare professionals will likely encounter and they can include anything from fibromyalgia uh, rheumatoid arthritis well any of the arthritis is lupus is lupus etc and um, even chronic fatigue is often a pain um, and so you know if you kind of learn about these you also often see chronic pain associated with depressions and anxieties and other medical uh, mental health disorders and it's hard sometimes to know is it the mental health disorder that causes the chronic pain or is it the chronic pain that causes the mental health disorder there's a lot that we really just don't know about that but those are the basic senses that are involved in the somatosensory in, uh, system and we're going to go on to, into some definitions and, and more information in the next group